Mark Bosco is with us tonight. He's been promoting and distributing independent features for well over 10 years. In addition to Mr. Bosco's keen understanding of every facet of film production, his impressive resume includes extensive work workings in public relations, marketing, and magazine publication. In his sensational new book, The Complete Independent Movie Marketing Handbook, he sheds light into a world that many independent filmmakers find complicated and intimidating. But thanks to an invaluable insider's perspective and a remarkably fluid and plain-spoken style of writing, Mr. Bosco provides these filmmakers with a comprehensive and detailed look at the world of marketing and distribution. And perhaps most impressively, he empowers them to navigate through this treacherous landscape with a new sense of confidence and understanding. Troma Entertainment President Lloyd Kaufman calls the book the best he has ever read about grassroots film marketing, while Blair Witch Project writer-director Eduardo Sanchez, who himself is no stranger to an effective marketing campaign, praises the book for being packed full of ideas, gimmicks, and ploys to get little films out there and noticed. It's a great pleasure to welcome to the show tonight Mr. Mark Stephen Bosco. Mr. Bosco, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, you got me? I got you. Th- thank you so much for calling in and being with us tonight. Hey, not a problem. After that intro, I think we could just end the show right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's got to be one of the best I've ever had. Oh, goodness. Well, thank you. Thank you so That's much. That's the all day. <laughs> uh, it's, it was a great pleasure to read your book, and, and we're definitely going to discuss, discuss this book. But first, give our listeners a little sense of how you started in the business and found your way into, into marketing and distribution. Well, it was a, uh, a path of must-do. It started uh, with myself as a filmmaker, uh, figuring out that selling a film really is something that you need to understand as a filmmaker. You're gonna, unless you have somebody in your corner to do it, you're gonna really lose a lot of money and and opportunities. Um, I had written, directed, really close out of college film with a partner of mine called Killer Nerd. It was a, uh, we utilized a couple of VJs at the time of the MTV craze. A horror comedy sold really well. And when you're in your very early 20s and you make, you know, a lot of money, or what seemed to us as a lot of money at the time, it was great and, you know, life was super. However, on the back end, when I started understanding what was going on, I realized how much money we didn't make uh, and started to work through the process myself of how films were sold, how those connections were made, what had to be done to have it happen, uh, and just learned that the only way to really get through that and not losing it all was to know a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Realized I liked that part of the process more than the creative part of the process, so uh, slowly but surely uh, ended up doing that. Well, well, speaking of, of creative personalities, I know that very early in your book you, you state that without distribution, you might as well leave the lens cap on. And, and I'm sure that probably the inspiration to write this book to begin with comes from a lot of filmmakers, the, the creative types, uh, the business side of things, uh, are, it's like a foreign language to them. But, but it's vitally important if you want to be a successful filmmaker, isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's, you know, that's the whole story is you have to find that that middle ground somewhere. You don't want to jeopardize the artistic integrity of a filmmaker, uh, whether you're working with them or uh, they're learning it on their own, so they become more of a businessman than a a film artist. However, you have to understand the process or you're going to risk creating something that has no commercial prospects Mm -hmm when all is said and done. And that's fine in several circumstances. If you're independently wealthy, if you view film as purely a form of artistic expression, uh, if the money you're using to create a film is coming from a place that you know doesn't need paid back, uh, all those are fine. However, if, if you're in the, the 99 percentile of people that are making film with their own or somebody else's investment, and you're looking to create a career in it, then you better create a commercial entity, one that's marketable. And the only way to understand that is to to learn about the business side of of the whole industry because what's commercial marketable today probably won't be five years from now, Mm -hmm. uh, may or may not be 
oh, five weeks from now, uh, and and why you can't make a, a film under those constraints to understand that. So when you are done and you uh, want to market the project, you'll have a better grasp of the uh, the tools you'll need to do that uh, with regard to language, with regard to who you're going to sell it to, with regard to your prospects, etc. Uh, yeah, that, and, that's also vital. And you do state that that your promotional efforts, at least your thinking of them, need to start uh, once you decide to make the film. And, Most definitely. And, yeah, and and there's some there's some early key things that you need to do, and they look very simple on paper, but. <laughs> But I'm sure that they're absolutely not. Uh, they could prove very challenging in some cases. Uh, and I'm talking about, first of all, the need to, to to be able to summarize your film in one concise sentence. Now, tell me why this is important. Well, that's that's really the basis of how films get sold at all levels. Well, whether you're talking about a film that gets sold uh, at a film market like AFM, which is currently happening, if you're talking about a film in the selling atmosphere of uh, uh, you and me at Best Buy looking at the shelves. Mm. People want to read. We live in a society uh, where you know it's sound bites and, and everything needs to be short and sweet, and you don't have a whole lot of time to make a decision or to, uh, to, to read three paragraphs to understand what a film's about. People want their entertainment, uh, their films especially, uh, easily digestible and understandable, and you see this uh, with films as large as the Transformers or as small as something as Night of the Living Dead uh, that's you know been remade again, yet again, uh, that quick sentence, it relays to the audience. It should describe certain things, the, the action of the movie. It should tell you who the audience for the movie is, and it should tell you about uh, possibly the setting and maybe even some emotional appeals that are included. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's many classic examples. I used the King Kong one. Uh, there's, you know, where you, yeah. you know, it's the... The large ape brought to you know New York City, so you have fish out of story waters in some regard, and the emotional appeal within that as well, and the setting, you know. So you know what's going to happen. That's important because a consumer, a film buyer, a foreign sales agent, all need to understand this immediately. Uh, they're busy, busy, busy people. And yeah. I, I can't tell you how many filmmakers I talk to that I say, you know, give me a title of your film. What's it about? Ten minutes later, they're still not done. That doesn't work. That's that's not that's not fight. good. Yeah, <laughs> people don't have, people don't have the patience anymore. I don't either. I mean, yeah, they rarely did ever. But uh, those kind of films that take that, there are audiences for them, and I love a slow, art, thoughtful, maybe described as an art house film. But but that's not something that you're going to be able to base a commercially successful filmmaking career on just making yeah. those. And I would think too, it's important for the filmmaker in the pre-production phase to be able to encapsulate what makes his film special as concisely as, po as, concisely as possible. Um, some other things that you've mentioned uh, is your film can't be all things to all people. You, you must know who your target audience is. Definitely. Um, again, you know, you look at a blockbuster, yeah, that's pretty much floating out there as almost all things to all people. You know, there's, there's a, you know, any large, like Spider-Man 3, uh, Transformers, any very big, huge Hollywood production tries that because they have such an investment in, into the film that they need to have an audience that big to, you know, earn their dollars back. Uh, but there's still a lot of people who don't want to see that, aren't interested in those films. So even in those rare instances, it really isn't all things to all people. On the independent side, it's even uh, more important because you have a limited budget, uh, so your film better be very focused with regard to its uh, ultimate audience and the genre it's delivering on, uh, or it's going to get lost, mm -hmm. or be competing against films of, you know, Better quality, maybe not better quality, but higher production value, and and you know maybe some star cast, and and that's going to be tough to compete with. Yeah, and I know that uh, on some occasions that, like you mentioned, the star cast, and it can be used as a hook for your film. And you talk about finding the hook for your film, which might be the trickiest area of all, because at w on one end of the spectrum, your film should be familiar, and yet have something that sets it apart. Yeah, you're, it's, that's a good point because that's even hard to learn or hard to uh, tell somebody what to do, and, and you nailed it on the head with that. You got to be, you you have to be able to be uh, that square peg for the square hole because that's what buyers want. However, 
you can't be derivative uh, at the same time and be the same as everything else that's out there. There are some instances where that's okay, and we'll see those those come and go. Uh, the the so-called torture porn style of films, the saws, the the hostels out there. Anybody that could put together a very slick looking movie with those kind of elements could have sold it real quick. I think there was one that came out. Uh, maybe gag or something like that. There were so many so fast, and, and we saw it with the, you know, the, all the slasher films back in the 80s. That was fine to be derivative then, but now you, you still need to be able to hit on that mark but have some also be able to distinct, distinguish yourself at the same time, and that is a, that is a difficult uh, walk to make, and that's why the thinking about these things on the pre-production side is so important so you don't uh, find yourself in that predicament halfway through production and you've sort of too far to go back and change it. Yeah, and I know that a lot of, a lot of filmmakers, they obviously uh, spend any monies that they have actually trying to produce their film. <laughs> uh, but you say that that shouldn't be an excuse for shortchanging your promotional efforts on that film. W- what are some tactics for the, for the low to no budget filmmaker? Well, they should always, regardless of how small your budget is, you should always keep a reserve for marketing, uh, promotion, a way to, even if it's promoting it to buyers, mm-hmm. uh, there, even if it's you know 5% of the budget, just so when you're all done, you don't find yourself thinking, oh, you know, even if we had another $1,000 to do this. Um, what you should do is network is one of the, the most important things right at the outset, uh, again, before you start making your film. Start talking to the buyers, the people who are going to uh, market your film uh, when, you're all, when, when you're finished with it. Go to a video store, go online, wh- whatever is easiest. Look at those movies that are very similar to the one you're planning and find the companies that are selling those. Call those guys up and just let them know what you're planning and ask them for some input. That's probably the most important thing an independent filmmaker can do mm. uh, before they, they launch into production because there's a lot of times when a, uh, a buyer, and these people will be more than happy to talk to you. They really will. Uh, independent filmmakers, they talk to them all the time about these things. Um, they'll tell you, you know, the, the cycle is dying and the last thing we'll want in a year and a half, you know, 18 to 24 months, which is the usual cycle for an independent film production from, you know, beginning to end is uh, another horror film or another, you know, family drama or something like that. It's yeah. those kind of conversations and those kind of uh, uh, relationships built early on that can really set an independent apart from all other independent filmmakers. Too many times an independent filmmaker will make their project in a vacuum. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of self-delusional to some extent that, you know, what they're making is going to be the next greatest film ever to... Uh, you know, to hit the screens, and when they are finished and they start uh, getting rejection to the project, they're surprised all of a sudden. And it's, well, a couple of conversations on the front end may have changed all of that. Yeah, and you've you've been mentioning some things that uh, that a potential distributor might be looking for from a film. Correct. Uh, what what are some other things that they might be looking for? And on the flip side of that, what should a filmmaker look for from a distributor? Well, to begin with. Um, what they're looking for really changes. It's always production value. Um, I hear it because I do I deal with the buyers, the distributors all the time. Is is they're looking for stars again because the foreign market is in the mode where they don't want to risk a starless film. Um, and it can be. It doesn't have to be huge Hollywood names. But if you look at the the movies that are on um, Stars Network or Cinemax or some of the non Main, main HBO channels, um, you'll see those kind of stars like the Armand Asante uh, yeah. level stars. And those will help, and, and the foreign market is vital to an independent filmmaker as well. The other thing they're looking for is uh, easily definable film, as we already spoke about, a, a genre film is what I'd call it. When a filmmaker makes a, uh, a drama that's really tough, or a comedy is really hard unless it's a... Uh, unless it's a genre comedy. Maybe it's an African-American themed comedy. Maybe it's an Asian themed comedy. Maybe it's a pot comedy. Mm -hmm. Any kind of comedy on an independent level should not be a mainstream comedy because people are always 
willing to uh, spend their money on Adam Sandler or somebody like that instead of taking the chance on an independent film because they don't that that comedian may not be a proven entity. Right. However, if it's a comedy about you know marijuana or something like that, they'll they'll go for it because those people are willing to take the chance on it. Horror films are always uh, a, the uh, the one that's always being asked for and never delivered on is family and uh, faith based faith based films. Yeah. And that's that's easy to understand because filmmakers are independent filmmakers are usually young hip people, uh, and most of them want to do another Reservoir Dogs. That's fun. That's cool. It's hip. Good language. Good you know action scenes, etc. You try to tell an independent filmmaker to go make a nice, touching, warm family film, and it usually doesn't resonate with them. Yeah. Uh, however, the market would love that because people that's what people are looking for. Same with faith-based films. Absolutely, uh, yeah. There's there's a huge market for that, huge. And the problem is, is independent filmmakers just don't make those kind of movies at this stage in their life. I don't think they're ready to do it because they're usually young people. Yeah. Um, what they should look for, what uh, filmmakers should look for on the flip side, is a company that has some history to it, uh, you know, d- there's always going to be a new company, and somebody's going to have to take a chance to be the new filmmaker with the new company. But uh, the the best thing to, for a, for a filmmaker to do before they sign a deal or before they decide to work with a distributor is to do some homework. Um, ask that person to be to to speak with other clients, other filmmakers they're working with, uh, so you can call those people and give them a call and say, you know, how is it working with this company? Mm-hmm. Most independent filmmakers are looking for advances. That's the money you would get before the deal, before you start sharing in the royalties of the sale of your film. That's very important. Um, only the best of the best independent films will will garner an advance for their movie uh, because there are so many independent films being made that distributors know they can make deals with these producers without paying them in advance. Um, uh, that's an unfortunate case, but uh, just as a, a matter of reference, last year there were nearly 7,000 independent feature-length films made. That's not counting shorts. That's not counting uh, episodic TV. That's just feature-length, 75 minutes or more uh, movies made, almost 7,000 of them. You know, that's, uh, what, almost 20 a day yeah. uh, ending up in these people's offices. So you can understand why they have the leverage when they're making the deal because... If you're selling a horror film and you don't like what they're offering, well, they probably have 10 or 15 more uh, sitting on their desk or in the coffers yeah. somewhere that they can, you know, go back to those producers on and make an offer to them. Exactly. Uh, so it puts the filmmaker at a great disadvantage at that point. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about about self-distribution um, because you cover that extensively in, in your book. Do you feel that the world of home video probably offers the most opportunities for a self-distributor? Um, that's changing rapidly. The electronic delivery method is going to be great uh, Mm -hmm. for for self-distribution once all the kinks are worked out. And there's a lot of places to go now, a lot of ways to monetize your content via the Internet. Um, Whether it's uh, an on-demand setup where your, uh, your film is housed basically on a server and then when somebody decides they buy it, uh, a consumer buys a copy of their film, your your DVD is actually created right at that point, that point. Yeah. or, a, or a, uh, an on-demand via uh, an Internet uh, streaming. So when they buy it, it, it streams to them right at that point. Um, there's a lot of uh, video channels being set up on the Internet that need content. All of these ways offer the independent filmmaker a route to to money from their film that they didn't have before. And these deals can all be arranged by the filmmaker. You don't need somebody like me, a producer's rep. You don't need a, a an attorney or anything like that to do it. It's a lot of work, a lot of legwork. However, it allows the independent filmmaker to maintain control over uh, the sale and promotion of his movie to an audience, and, and he will see greater profits, maybe not aggregate, but per sale because there's no middleman taking money out and there's no packaging, there's nothing like that. It's a, you know, once you get the tape onto the server, or the film onto the server, you're basically done. It's just a person either downloading it or streaming it at that point. Yeah, and the Internet really has mm-hmm. kind of revolutionized the, the industry in a way, and it's only going to get bigger, I, I believe. 
you know, the, your, your, all the content of your book, it applies not only for feature films, but a lot of it applies for instructional uh, uh, videos, documentaries. Is there a marketplace for, for short films? Um, yeah, again, uh, what's, what's really becoming good for the short film category are mobile devices. Um, there's four distributors now that are buying content, very short content for cell phone, mobile phone uh, downloading. Now, mm. I personally don't watch movies on my cell phone, <laughs> but a lot of people do. It's a younger generation thing. Um, and when you consider the screen of a mobile phone, some of the restrictions become on what they're looking for. They're looking for a lot less dialogue, uh, a lot of action, a lot of visual action, not a whole lot of uh, a narrative structure, and short in length, obviously. So uh, there's buyers that are looking for movies that are five minutes and under uh, with a lot of close-up visual action because of the small screen size. You don't want a lot of long, broad shots. You can't uh, make out the, uh, the detail in right. the, in the footage. But yeah, that, uh, a lot of the iPod-related downloads, the movie store, uh, iTunes is right now starting to write contracts with a lot of the independent uh, film providers out there and so just the big studios because they realize how uh, stiff the competition's getting for, uh, you know, to have the big catalog and, and offer all that. Amazon obviously offers downloads now via their Unbox service. Uh, so yeah, it's it's good stuff for a short filmmaker because people want you know a ten minute, five minute movie mm -hmm. to either take them on their train ride or their bus ride or whatever it, the case may.